Here's an interesting thing. Um, he says, during the war, we lost approximately 10,000 men to other than enemy fire. Vietnam was so full of treachery, danger, and outright bad luck that he's on this administrative mission and he's just like playing it safe because he doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to get killed by a criminal or get in a car accident. But you don't think about 10,000 people dying in Vietnam just from other than combat. Mm. The heavy rain to discourage the enemy from moving against us. That was some comfort. Obviously, they were human after all. Too often they seemed above the constraints of normal men, too hardened to the rigors that wore down the rest of us. Although it was tempting to rest on our haunches, taking advantage of the respite offered by the weather, I knew that in the long run it would be safer to push more on the offensive. To lie back would only allow the enemy to build their strength as I was building mine and allow them to choose the time and place of the next strike. I decided to go after them in their lair. One of the personnel changes I made was to take Killigan out of his squad leader position. A sergeant arrived to take over the squad. I passed word to him to keep Killigan off point. Killigan did not like it and was close to the point of rebellion, but I refused to put him back on point. His luck was about to run out. No matter how good he might be, the odds are heavily stacked against the point man. My order, however, meant little. Invariably, Killigan would move up to the front, always out there a little advance of the moving element. It was a role he defined for himself. So obviously, we're going to continue. The, one of the themes of this book is be aggressive and stay on the offense. That's absolutely true. The reason I highlighted that thing with Killigan was because here you got a guy that's all about good order and discipline. But guess what? He's telling Killigan, don't walk point, don't walk point, don't walk point. And Killigan goes, okay, yeah, I won't walk point. Goes out on patrol, goes up to point. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's also one of those things where, you know, it's, sometimes I get asked, you know, my boss is not doing this or we're not getting, we're getting, we're not getting clear direction or I don't agree with this thing. Sometimes you got to make some stuff happen. <laughs> you know, especially if it's the right thing to do. You got to make some stuff happen sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now, they do some some operations and they're starting to take some toll on the enemy. And here's what the enemy does. The enemy retaliated, retaliated with more booby traps and other irregular attacks. One morning, the village chief was caught at the well as he bathed his ever present 40 45 caliber pistol left a few feet away with his pile of clothes. A small, nine-year-old boy, no doubt acting on orders from a relative, walked up, smiled, and shot the chief twice with a twenty-two caliber pistol. Once again, however, the chief survived, returning a few weeks later to resume his post. Specialist Barnes, back from six days in Australia, stepped on a booby trap and lost his right leg at the hip. Robson, the nervous baby-faced kid from Illinois who had arrived with Palamon, got wedged headfirst in a Viet Cong tunnel as he was clearing it. He panicked, vomited, and drowned in his own puke before he could be pulled back out. Another man recently arrived, sat down beside a trail to take a break, and tripped a Chinese claymore with his butt. I hoped his mother would not ask to open his coffin. <laughs> 